Hansessa present the Oval Portrait by Edgar Allan Poe. A shadow in which my valet had ventured to make forcible entrance rather than permit me, in my desperate wounded condition, to pass the night in such open air was one of those poles a commemorated gloom and grandeur, which had been so long frowned am- among the Pennines, not less in the fact than in fancy of Miss Redcliffe. Tall appearance had been temporarily and very lately abandoned. They established themselves in one of the smallest and least stumpless furnished apartments. We stood in it, it lay a small turret of a building, its decorations were rich, yet tattered and in, in, antique. Its walls were hung with tapestry, its deck were manifold and man, manifold, and were all trophies, together with an old, usually great number of var, very spirited modern paintings and frames of rich golden aspects. In these paintings, which depend from the walls, not only in their main surface, but in very m- many nooks, which bizarre and architecture of the chateaus rendered necessary. In these paintings, my insipid delirium, perhaps, had caused me to take deep interest that I begged Pedro to close the highway shutters of the room, since it is already night. To light the tongues of a tall colonium, we stood on the head of my bed. To be to throw open far and wide the fringe curtains of black velvet, we over the bed. Itself had wished all is done, might resign myself, if not to sleep, at least in, in, in order of content, contentment with these pictures. and in presumption with the usual volume being found upon the pillow which were thought to criticise and describe them. Long, long I read, and then devoutly, devoutly I gazed. Rapidly and gloriously the flowers flew by. A deep midnight came. The position of the candelindrum displeased me. Reaching my hand and without reaching my hand with difficulty rather than disturbing disturb my slumbering valet. I placed it so as it threw its rays upon fully up, upon the book. But the action produced an effect altogether and appreciated. The rays and numerous candles, for there were many, now fell within an inch of the room, which had hitherto been thrown into deep shade by one of the best posts. I thus saw a vivid light, a picture all unnoticed before. It was a portrait of a young girl. I glanced, a young girl just ripening into womanhood. I glanced at the painting hurriedly, then closed my eyes. Why did this not at first apparent even to my own perception? For while my lids remained thus shut, I ran over in my mind my reason for shutting them. It was impulsive movement to gain time for thought, to share make sure that my vision had not deceived me, to calm and subdue my fancy to, for a more sombre and more certain gaze. In a few moments I again looked fixedly at the painting. Then I saw right. I could not, would not doubt, the first flashing of the candle upon the canvas that seemed to dissipate the dreary sombre that was stealing over my senses that started me at once into waking life. 
The portrait, however, what he said, was that of a young girl. His mere head and shoulders done in what is technically termed as a vigorous manner. Much in the style of the favourite heads of Sully. The arms, the bosom, even the ends of radiant hair, melted perfectly the vivid but deep shadow which formed the background of the whole. Frame is oval, richly gilded, and forever green in musquit. A thing of art, nothing could be more admirable than the painting itself. It could have been neither the execution of the work nor the immortal beauty of the canvas, which had so suddenly, so vividly moved me. Least of all, could it have been that my fancy, shaken from its half slumber, and mistaken the head for that of a living person. I saw at once that the peculiarities of design, the vigorating, the frame must have instantly dispelled such idea. It must have prevented even its monthly entertainment. Thinking earnestly upon these points, I remained for an hour, perhaps, half sitting, half reclining, my vision riveted upon the portrait. At length, satisfied the true secret of its effect, I fell back within the bed, I f- found the spell of the picture, in absolute lifelessness of expression, which at first startling, finally confounded, subdued and appalled me, with deep and reverence, or I replaced the candelium in its former position. The cause of my deep meditation being thus shut from view, I saw eager the volume which discussed the paintings and their histories, turning to the numbers which desecrate the overall portrait. I have read the vague and quaint words which follow. <laughs> she was a maiden of various beauty, not more lovely than full of glee. Evil was the hour when she saw and loved and wedded the painter. He, passionate, studious, astute, having ready a bride in his art, she a maiden rarest beauty, and not more lovelier than the full of glee, all light and smiles, frolicsome as a young fawn, loving and cherishing all things, hating only the art which was a rival, dreading only the palette and brushes, the other, the other untoward instruments to deprive her of the countenance of her lover. It was thus a terrible thing for this lady to hear the painter speak, desire to portrait even his young bride, but she was humble, obedient, sat meekly for many weeks in a high, dark high turret chamber where the light dripped upon the pale canvas only from overhead. But he, the painter, took glory in his work, which went on from hour to hour and from day to day. He was passionate and wild and moody man, he became lost in reveries, so that he would not see the light which fell so ghastly in the lone turret, withered in health and the spirits of his bride, who pined visibly to, in, to all but him. Yet he, she smiled on and still on, a clown flaming, because she saw a painter who had high renowned, took a fervid and burning passion in his task, brought day and night to depict her, whom she so loved, yet who drew day more dispirited and weak and smooth some who beheld the portrait spoke resemblance to low words as a mighty marvel and a proof not less the power of the painter of the deep love for whom he depicted so surprisingly well but at length labour near drew nearer to its conclusion they admitted none in the turret of the painter grown wild ardour for his work turned his eyes the canvas rarely, even to regard the countenance of his wife. He could not see the tints which he spread upon the tantress were drawn from the cheeks of her sat beside him. Many weeks had passed, and but little remained to do, save one brush upon the mouth and one tint upon the eye. The spirit lady again flickered up in the flame in the socket of the lamp. When the brush was given, then a tint was placed. For a moment the painter stood entranced before the work which he had wrought, but the next, while he gazed, he grew temperous, very pallid, and gasped and crying, a loud voice, This is indeed life itself, 
turned suddenly to regard his beloved. She was dead.